Hello and welcome back. So the purpose of this channel and this draft series is to allow you to extract as much value as you can out of your draft. And that means picking players at the right time in the draft and hoping they exceed their draft position. So today we're talking about goaltending. And in my first video on this channel, and arguably the most important one, I suggested that the number one rule to follow for your fantasy draft is to not draft a goalie in the top two rounds. And I highlighted that championship teams usually draft goalies in the 4th to 6th round range and the 7th to ninth round range depending on league size. So that would usually be in the 30 to 50 range and the 60 to 90 range. And this is all well and good. But now as we get closer to the drafting season, the question for today is who do you draft in these positions and what is most important to look for in goaltending? So... Just a, a quick reminder of, uh, of what we're talking about here. Goaltending is important, but it's not the most important thing. So if you look here, this is my league. Um, these are the, the goaltending aggregated win percentage. So this is all four goaltending categories put together and how often they were won by a certain team. The number one guy for goaltending was Crashline. Um, he had 72% of his goaltending categories most of the time. He finished third in the regular season. He ended up losing in the playoffs, and he finished sixth overall. Ottawa Truckers had the second best goaltending. He had 68% of his goaltending categories covered. He ended up fourth. Not bad, uh, but not in a position to win back his money. Lake Mohawk Moose, he was third in goaltending. He ended up fifth. I actually edged him out, like barely edged him out in the playoffs, and that put him fifth. He easily could have finished in the top three. But what you want to take away from this is none of these guys won the league. The guy who won the league had the best offense. Now, this is a little outdated. I've since updated this. Um, but the point remains that goaltending is important, but it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is your offense. So what you're looking for with goaltending um, is typically uh, minimum 50 starts. 50 starts is right about where the delineation is between a bona fide starter and a 1A, 1B. Anything between 35 and 50 games is a pure split. And there were five goalies who appeared in more than 60 games last year. Saros, Hellebuck, Demko, Vasilevsky, and Markstrom. And we'll take a look at this in a, in a second um, as we go into the data. You typically want to find somebody above a 915 save percentage. So last year, the league average was 905. And you obviously need better than league average goaltending. Usually anything between 905 and 915 can potentially be found on the waiver wire. And, uh, you know, sometimes you're going to find somebody on the waiver wire who doesn't start as much as a quality starter, but they'll put up better than a 915. And it just depends on what kind of category coverage you want. But if you have a goalie on a great team getting you lots of starts and wins and some shutouts, the save percentage can dip below 915. Uh, but there were only 17 goalies last year and 10 bona fide starters who put up better than a 915 last year. So that's why you want to target uh, somebody above 915. You typically want somebody who's playing behind a top defense. So at least a top 16 defense in the league because that puts them in the top half. And what that means is they're suppressing shots and you're not, your goalie is not going to face 40 shots a game. So for example, Shesterkin. Unbelievable goalie, best goalie in the league last year, but he had to make 40 saves like nine or 10 times last year. And I think he was nine and one uh, when he faced 40 saves or 40 shots, um, which is incredible given, you know, the the, the strength of, of the league and everything else that went into that metric. But you don't want to rely on that. You want somebody who's going to get you 30 to 35 saves a game max. Like you don't want to be pushing that. You don't want to be feeling uncomfortable as your goalie's getting shelled night in and night out. Um, and typically, teams that have good defenses are teams they're going to win. So they're going to get you 40 plus wins. So you want a, a goaltender that's playing on a team that wins, obviously, more often than not, um, because that's going to help you with wins, but it's also going to help you with shutouts. Um, and that, you know, shutouts are a little bit difficult to predict. And when you're playing in the playoffs, it's very difficult to try to bank on a shutout. Um, you're usually, it's just one week. You maybe have three or four starts, not even four, usually two to three starts per goalie. And it's very difficult to bank on shutouts. They're kind of a bonus in that regard. The bubble team bonus down here, what that is. Um, so basically, and I've gone through this personally, it may be preferable to pick a goalie from a team that is going to be battling for a playoff spot down the stretch as opposed to a team who's a number one team in the league because if they're a number one team in the league 
they might sit their goaltender for longer stretches in the most crucial point of your fantasy season. So the end of the regular season for the NHL is when your fantasy playoffs take place. And if you have a guy like Vasilevsky and Tampa Bay is going to be potentially resting him for the playoffs, you may get screwed. Your number one goalie, the guy who got you to where you are, is now on the bench and he's only playing one game in your playoff week. Um, So this is just something that you may want to keep in the back of your mind. You may want to look for somebody like Soros or Demko, maybe Jari, um, you know, a guy who's on a good team, but a team that might be a bubble team. They might need to play their starter down the stretch in order to make the playoffs. That's something that you might want to keep in the back of your mind, because when you're playing in your playoffs, you don't want your best goaltender on the bench. Um, So that's that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, but as we move into this analysis here, um, I'll pull it over. This is the goaltending dashboard. So this is uh, appearances. This is not just starts. It's appearances because anytime your goalie appears in a game, you get stats for that. And you can filter this by team to see what the, the share is. So, for example, Boston, they had an exact 41-41 split. And you can see that visualized here. This is appearances ranked. So this is just how many times the goalie got into a game. And you can see the rankings here. Obviously, um, some of the workhorses that I mentioned, there's uh, six guys who played more than 60 games. They're all at the top here. Um, And then what you see here, appearances and save percentage. So I put the two on the same graph. So you can see appearances in blue and then save percentage in orange. Now, the relationship between the orange and blue is not necessarily what's important. What's important is these are the averages, these lines right here. So you want a goalie who gets you a lot of appearances and is well above average in save percentage. UC Soros was incredible last year. He did a 918 save percentage, and he did it in 67 games. Um, His win percentage wasn't as high uh, because obviously Nashville was uh, not doing well in the first half. They, They turned it on towards the end. But that's what I'm talking about. The second half of the year, they came alive, and they had to play Soros every single game in order to make sure that they made the playoffs. And so he was a very valuable fantasy goaltender because of that. You look at Markstrom, he was incredible last year, 922 save percentage in 63 games. But you can see here, these are the guys that get 60 starts at least. This is your range. So you can see at the bottom here, this is uh, 50 games. So anything between this line and this line is uh, considered a starter, quote unquote, in terms of how many games they start. Obviously, there's some goalies in here you're not going to want to touch, like Vimelka. Uh, Nadelkovic is not going to start that much this year, as they just brought in Huso. Merzlikens, we'll come back to him at a later point. Jari, Kemper, Gibson, Flurry, Grubauer, Bobrovsky, Shesterkin, Anderson, Sorokin. These are G1s. Um, at, at, these are at least the minimum threshold for games played for G1s. Now, what you look at over here is goals against and save percentage on the same graph. So this is goals against in blue, save percentage in orange. And the further these are apart, the better the goalie is. So you look at Shesterkin, 2.1 goals against, 935 save percentage, absolutely insane. And he was the best goalie in the league. This is basically, you're looking at kind of the... um, It's not exact, but it it basically mirrors the end Yahoo rankings. So Shesterkin was number one. I think Markstrom was number two. Uh, Sorokin was number three. But regardless, all these guys who were at the top of this list, um, notwithstanding guys like Comrie and Stolarz who didn't start a lot, um, but these are the guys that are going to be at the upper end of your Yahoo fantasy goaltending rankings. So this is, uh, you can find all of these, these charts and graphs in the description below, and you can play with them yourself. This is just save percentage, strictly uh, a bar graph of save percentage if you want to just look at the list and see how, how this ranked out. Um, shutouts per appearance. So this is an interesting metric. Look at Casey DeSmith. He's up here uh, with these two guys who were incredible goaltenders. Sorokin had seven shutouts. Markstrom had nine. DeSmith didn't play a lot, but when he did, he got shutouts. And what that tells me is that Pittsburgh is a pretty decent defensive team if their backup goalie can put up that many shutouts per start. Um, Same thing with Stolarz. It doesn't necessarily say the same thing about Stolarz in terms of his team, but Stolarz definitely outplayed John Gibson last year. So that's something to keep an eye on this year, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. This last graph is just shutouts. So just so you can see what the guys put up last season, Um, You can kind of tell which guys got shutouts, but again, shutouts are a little fickle. You don't really know 
um, going into the year, who's going to put up nine shutouts. And Markstrom put up most of that in the first couple of months of the season and then kind of tailed off a little bit. Sorokin, um, if you combine Sorokin and Varlamov, they both put up a lot of shutouts, despite the fact that they didn't win a lot of games because the Islanders weren't that good. Um, but this is, uh, again, you can go and check this out. This is in the description below. And we will maybe refer to this a little bit later in this um, in this uh, presentation. But what you want to focus on is these are the guys. These are the goaltenders that hit those marks. The 50 games started, the 915 plus on a top defensive team. And they also had uh, 40 plus wins for that team. Not that the goalie had 40 plus wins, but that team got more than 40 wins. So these are the guys, Shesterkin, Anderson, Markstrom, Kemper, Jari, and Vasilevsky. Now, the guy who stands out here is obviously Tristan Jari. He's a little bit of a surprise, but if you look into the data, it makes a lot of sense. Pittsburgh is usually a top five defensive team when they're healthy. They weren't healthy last year, so they dipped a bit. But Mike Sullivan has a good system in place. And if you look at Jari over the last three years, he's had a 243, 275, and a 242 goals against. He's also had a 921 a 909 and a 919 save percentage, <clears throat> excuse me, and 20, 25, and 34 wins. So he's trending in the right direction, and he will obviously have a lot of familiarity with his defense and his defensive scheme, despite some of the trades that were made. So they made a, a couple of moves on their blue line, but for the most part, some of the, the stalwart rock guys there are, are still there. And you look at Chris Letang as, as that number one defenseman, and he's still on that blue line for the foreseeable future. So what these goalies provide you is not just elite numbers, but also stability. And the problem with some of these guys is they will get drafted a little bit too high in the first or second round, and you won't be able to extract enough value out of them to warrant the pick there. But these guys will give you reliability and consistency. And if you're taking a goaltender as your G1, you need reliability and consistency. You don't want to take a shot on a guy who's going to be a wild card, who is maybe in the first year with a new team, playing in front of a new defense, um, and having to adjust to all these different factors. You'd prefer to have somebody who's comfortable where they are, who's played with those defensemen before, know where the shots are going to come from, and can provide you with value that way. So this is the list. This is your G1 list. This, These are the guys who more than likely this year will put up at least 50 starts, probably get somewhere around or above a 915 on a team that, you know, not all these teams are going to get 40 plus wins. So you kind of have to rank them based on your, your personal preference and what categories you're going to try to corner. Um, but these are the guys who were probably going to start more than 50 games. And that seems to be a premium this year because a lot of goaltenders last year were in tandems and, you know, 1A, 1B situations or, you know, straight up splits. Um, and this is sorted in descending order according to Yahoo Fantasy Rank at the end of last season. So you see Shesterkin was one, Markstrom two, Anderson, and so on. Um, the guys with the asterisks here, these are goaltenders that have more than capable backups. Um, Shesterkin, uh, I'm not sure how good Halak is going to be this year. Uh, when he played in Boston, he was a, a premier backup for Tuka Rask. He was you know, a guy who would put up above a 915 save percentage and they could play him a little bit. Um, so it'll be interesting this year to see, but you know, you look at Shesterkin's game play, games played, 53 games played, that's not exactly, you know, you're getting 10 fewer games than Markstrom, and Markstrom had a, a little bit worse save percentage, but he had nine shutouts. So, you know, you might want to go the route of the guy who starts more just because of that. So the, the guys with the asterisks are closer to the 50 game threshold. So you look at 53, 52, 52, 54, and if you look at these guys' backups, you know, Anderson has Ranta. He's a quality backup. Sorokin has Varlamov. He's a quality backup. Bobrovsky has Spencer Knight. He's a quality backup. And so if you take one of these guys, you may want to think about handcuffing them to their backup, especially Bobrovsky and Knight, because they're on a, a quality team last year that won. Uh, did they win the President's Trophy? I think they won it. They edged it out at the end. Um, but they were one of the best teams in the regular season last year. And if you can get uh, exposure to both of their goaltenders, it will probably pay off for you, despite the fact that I'm not a huge fan of Bobrovsky. Um, but this is what you want to pay attention to, is these are the guys that you want to pick at least one guy from. Uh, if you can pick two, uh, that would be obviously better than only having one of these guys and trying to get a guy who's in a timeshare. Um, but this is the list that you want to pick from. Now, 
Something I want to point you to, Soros. 67 games played, 918, 2.7, 4 shutouts, 38 wins. To me, I'm very high on UC Soros this year. Why? Because this year he's going to have either Roman Yossi or Ryan McDonough on the ice for 50 minutes per game. That's incredible. That's insane. Ryan McDonough was arguably, um, I mean, he was maybe like fourth in voting for the Conn Smythe uh, a year or two ago. And he is incredibly valuable as a stay-at-home defenseman, as a two-way defenseman. He's not necessarily as offensive as Yossi, but both of them are really quality defensemen. And then you also have Eckholm there. He's a really good stay-at-home defenseman as well. Um, And another thing to notice, Nashville has made the playoffs every year since 2014. They haven't won a round since 2018, but fantasy is all about the regular season performance. And the fact that they're one of the top 16 teams in the league every year is impressive. And it's something that you should factor into your decision making. Now, as we look down this list, you see guys like Flurry. Some of his numbers do not add up in terms of he's not above a 915 and yada, yada, yada. Obviously, this was because a lot of the stats was from Chicago and he's on Minnesota now. Minnesota gave Cam Talbot a bunch of great stats last year, um, albeit he had a 9-11 save percentage, so not that much better than Flurry. but they are an incredible team. They are going to win a ton of games, and they are going to have a good enough defense to provide him with a couple more shutouts than what he had last year, um, and pretty much he doesn't have a capable backup. He has Gustafson, who's not bad, but he's not a guy who's going to be pushing for starts and pushing as a 1B. So Flurry will probably get more than 56 games this year, um, and that's something to keep an eye on. Now, Hellebuck, he starts a lot. He was, you know, the second highest starter in the league last year in terms of games played. His save percentage, 9-10, nothing to write home about. He has the capability, though. We all know that he has the capability to be that elite goaltender. But, you know, for whatever reason, Winnipeg just doesn't like to play defense, and I don't necessarily know what to make of Rick Bonus coming in I don't see that as a, a, a complete upgrade over Paul Maurice um, in terms of the defensive structure and seeing, you know, obviously Dallas had a, had a good defensive structured team, but, you know, a lot of that came out of Jim Montgomery's system and maybe Rick Bonus continued that. Maybe he'll carry that over to Winnipeg. It's a lot up in the air, um, but Hellebuck starts a ton, so that's something you want to keep an eye on. Bennington, I'm almost ashamed to put him on this list, but if you look at it, um, He's going to be the number one. I mean, there's he's got Thomas Grice as his backup. Um, you know, I've never used Bennington. He had one three or four month stretch of elite play that led St. Louis to the Cup, but otherwise he's been average at best and not really a reliable fantasy option in my opinion. Um, the reason he's on here is because the St. Louis Blues are a top five team in the West and they're returning almost exactly the same team. Billy Huso's gone. Grice is the backup, so Grice will take a couple of starts off of his plate, but Bennington will probably be relied upon to start 55 or 60 games, and he'll probably fall in a lot of drafts due to his poor numbers. He had a 901. So if you're you're in a league with guys who only look at the stats that are on the Yahoo Fantasy page as they're drafting, they're not going to pick him because he's got a 901 save percentage and a 3.1 goals against. He didn't have a lot of wins. He didn't have a lot of shutouts. So you, you may be able to get him at value if you're looking deeper in your draft. Another thing to notice, Ottinger, he's not signed right now as of making this video. Um, but he will more than likely get more than 48 starts because Scott Wedgwood is his backup. Um, he put up a good season last year, 914, 2.5, uh, 30 wins in 48 games. That's a pretty high win percentage. Um, and he's going to get more starts than that because, like I said, he doesn't have that much of a quality backup. So this is the list. If you're going into your draft, these are the guys that you're going to want to pick from. Um, as we move on, these are the tandem options. So... L.A. and Boston were 2-3, and three, respectively, in shots against last year. Both of their teams used both of those goalies. And Swayman and Ulmark, they each started 41 games last year, as we saw in the graphic before. Ulmark had a 9.17 and a 2.5. Swayman had a 9.14 and a 2.4. So they're virtually identical goaltenders. If you have both of them, you're basically getting a combined 82 starts, a 2.45 goals against, and a 9.15 save percentage. But you need both of them. You can't just pick one and hope that you can filter in with somebody else. If you get both of them, you get access to this this overall team defense. Boston is returning. Bergeron, Krejci came back. Once they get healthy, they might be uh, you know back to their previous form. But one thing to keep in mind is McAvoy and Grizzlick are hurt to start the season. 
So their defense isn't going to be as good as it usually is until around December when both of them are back. Now with LA, analytics people and goalie guru Kevin Woodley loves Cal Peterson, but last year he was unable to steal the net from Jonathan Quick and he put up way below average numbers. So it's difficult to say what will happen this year, but both goalies play behind a good defensive team and they have an improved offense with Fiala in the mix, Byfield, Kaliev, their younger guys got a little bit older and they're poised to take a jump in the standings this year. They obviously made the playoffs last year uh, despite the fact that they were injured. Dowdy missed a lot of time. Um, so they, you know, LA is poised to take a jump in the standings and um, I, if I were you, I wouldn't try to guess which one of them is going to start. I would handcuff them together. Um, now, if you look... A little bit further down, I have Georgiev and Fransos. Um, you know, I don't think that Georgiev's a number one, necessarily. I think that, uh, you know, if you look at his numbers, he had an 898 save percentage last year, and Fransos had a 916, I believe. So Fransos was the better goalie, um, you know, just on paper. And the Rangers were not a bad defensive team. They actually suppressed more shots than that Colorado Avalanche did last year. Um, so it's not like Yurgiev is going from a horrible defensive team to a great one. He's going from a good defensive team to a better offensive team. And I don't necessarily see him as just completely stealing the job from Fransos. I think of that more as a pairing, more as a split. So if you get one, you should get both. If you don't get Georgiev and Fransos is there later in the draft, you may want to take him as your G3. If anything happens to Georgiev, they're going to look at Fransos as their number one. And you may get exposure to Colorado and that level of wins and you know obviously their their production they're an incredible team Stanley Cup champions and you may be able to get their number one goalie deep in the draft if somebody else takes Georgiev first and Fransos is sitting there later on now as we look down this list again uh, many people assume that Cam Talbot is going to be the starter in Ottawa I'm not so sure uh, if you look at the data Talbot playing for the wild had a 9.11 save percentage in 49 appearances, while Anton Forsberg had a 9.17 in 46 appearances on a much worse Ottawa Senators team. So there will probably be an adjustment period for Talbot coming to a new team with a new and possibly worse defense core in front of him, and I think it's much more likely we see a 1A, 1B situation, if not a complete split. So basically, don't reach for Talbot. If he falls to you, pair him up with Forsberg, and you know you should do that if you believe in the new look Senators. I kind of, you know, I do believe in the new look Senators, but I, I'm not going to, you know, base my entire team off of trying to get Talbot, you know, earlier in the draft. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it later. I'm going to pair him with Forsberg. Down here, Huso and Nedeljkovic, crapshoot. That's a real crapshoot because Detroit is not good defensively. They did improve. They got a lot of guys. In free agency, we'll have to wait and see. I would look at these guys as waiver candidates. Um, I wouldn't necessarily reach to grab Huso. I don't necessarily, I mean, he could be a starter, but he could be a 1A. He might not put up more than 50 starts. Nadelkovic could have a bounce back. There's a lot of question marks there. If you're really desperate, um, I do think New Jersey is going to have a good season this year. So you may want to find some exposure there, but Blackwood hasn't been consistent. He hasn't been that good lately. And Vanacek was a sub-900 save percentage goaltender last year. And Washington's goaltending was so bad that it basically cost them their season and they did not return either guy. So you want you want to be careful there with Vanacek and Blackwood because there's a lot of question marks there. Um, but if you're going to get one of them, you should get both of them because you're, you want the exposure to the team, which should be improved, um, especially with Jack Hughes. If he can stay healthy, they will probably uh, pick off a couple of wins in that division. And you could potentially expose yourself, but I would do so on the waiver wire. So we kind of got into it a little bit at the end there, but your G3s are typically your high-risk candidates, the guys that you're going to swing for the fences for. And in this case, you know, this list, these are more guys that are going to start as opposed to timeshares. Um, but these are the guys you want to look at. Logan Thompson. You know, Robin Leonard getting hurt, this opened up a huge opportunity for Logan Thompson. Vegas had the eighth best shot suppression numbers last year. They just didn't stay healthy. They didn't have the offense. Stone was hurt. All, all the, you know, top offensive guys were hurt at one point or another. Um, but they still have a great defense. They still have Petrangelo and Theodore and um, McNabb and, and you know, uh, Martinez is still there. So they, they still have the defense for... Uh, a good goaltending performance for your fantasy team. But be careful, because if he doesn't cut it early on, 
Vegas is proactive and they will probably look to find somebody else using Leonard's cap space. They have 5 million, uh, at least in, in LTIR relief from Robin Leonard. And they're the type of team that if Logan Thompson sucks for the first 20 games, they're just going to go out and find somebody else. Like they're not going to stick with him. Um, John Gibson, look, he got more than 50 starts last year and he is deemed the starter in Anaheim, but I don't know what to make of him. He gets plenty of starts, but he got outplayed by Stolarz last year, as we saw in that data. And if you go back and look, you know, in that data, Stolarz is way higher in basically every metric. Um, but one thing, and I want to point, the, uh, I want to shout out Fantasy Tipped on YouTube for bringing this to my attention. Anaheim plays teams who are on the second night of a back-to-back 19 times next year, and that's insane. And those could be easy wins for Gibson or Stolarz. So you may be able to play the schedule a little bit with John Gibson and use that to your advantage, uh, despite the fact that he's not, um, you know, he had a 904 save percentage last year, which is, you know, hovering around league average. Um, so he's not that great, but he's going to start a lot of games and they have an advantageous schedule, something to keep an eye on. Philip Grubauer is probably the most intriguing guy on this list. So last year he had 55 starts and he was the worst goalie in the league, 889 save percentage. Um, if you look at all of his previous seasons in the NHL, here are his save percentages. A 922 in Colorado, 916 in Colorado, 917 in Colorado, 923 in Washington, 926 in Washington, 918 in Washington, and a 920 in Washington. So he's pretty much above 915 every single year of his career except last year. What that tells me, last year was a year of a lot of change, coming to a literal brand new team in the league, having to move, having to sign a free agent deal in the offseason. Potentially, you know, he might have thought he was going to go back to Colorado and they didn't offer him a deal or whatever. Um, but, you know, he's a guy who typically career-wise puts up really good save percentage and goals against numbers. Um, but, he just didn't do that at all last year. He had a horrible year. I would look for a bounce back. On top of that, Seattle Seattle was a top four defensive team last year. And they did lose Giordano, but they should have a more potent offense this year, which will bring them a couple more wins. So if you're looking and you're deep in your draft and Grubauer's sitting there, he's going to be a starter. Martin Jones is his backup. So he's going to get the starts. And I don't see any any way that he's as bad as he was last year. So at, at worst, he'll put up, uh, in, in my opinion, he'll put up a 9-10, 9-15 at minimum because every year in his career, he's been above a 9-15. Um, and oftentimes, he's been above a 9-20. So that's a guy to look for if you're looking for deep, deep value. Merzlikens, he's had, uh, he had 59 games last year and a 9-07 on a Columbus team that had some injuries to their blue line last year. This year, they added Gabranson to their decor. That will probably help with their defensive numbers. They still have Wierenski. They still have Boquist. They added Goudreau for more offensive punch. He will probably be available later in drafts and could be a, you know, a good G2 value who has uh, you know, a bulk of starts. So you're, if you get him as a G2, he's going to be a guy that's going to get you a lot of starts and a lot of numbers, uh, and you could probably get him a little bit later <clears throat> in the draft. Excuse me. I've been feeling a little under the weather lately, which is uh, why this video is coming out later. So Jake Allen, Montreal's defense isn't anything to write home about, but their offense is probably improved given the additions of Slavkowski and Dadanoff. And uh, with St. Louis behind the bench, and last year they had minor league goaltending, basically, they finished 14-9-1. So Price doesn't look like he's going to play. The most recent news is that he will likely start on long-term injured reserve. So Allen will be the starter, and he'll get starter minutes. They don't really have... Uh, a 1B capable backup. Caden Primo was terrible last year. So I would look at Jake Allen. He's going to get the starts. If you're you know, looking for a G2 or a G3 and Jake Allen is sitting there, the defense is not great and you're not going to get yourself exposure to some team that's going to have a ton of wins, but he'll get you starts and he could potentially have a little bit of a bounce back uh, after the disastrous injury riddled season last year. Now, an interesting guy here, Eric Comrie. He was on a not-so-good Winnipeg team last year, but he put up stellar numbers. He had a 2.6 goals against, a 920 save percentage in 19 appearances. So he didn't get a lot of playing time, but he did well when he did play. Um, and now he's in Buffalo, so he will be battling uh, against, I think, Craig Anderson still. Um, Uko Pekalukunen, 
I don't know if he's ready. Maybe he'll challenge a little bit. Um, so we'll have to see what happens at a training camp. And maybe he's a guy that you look on the waiver wire uh, to pick up if he starts doing well early in the season. But you look at Buffalo, they have Darlene. He's coming into his own right now. He's starting to play like a number one defenseman. And they all, they're they going to add Owen Power to that blue line this year. So rookie defensemen usually don't bode well for goaltenders. But, you know, again, in a deep league, off the waiver wire, he could be worth a look. Um, Carter Hart should be primed for a breakout season, depending on the health of Ryan Ellis and the impact of Tortorella. If Torts can get the Flyers to play better defense, if Ellis is healthy, Hart should be getting 50-plus starts on a team that honestly can't get any worse than they were last year. And last year, on a terrible team, he put up a league average 905 save percentage and a 3.16 goals against. So he wasn't really the fantasy option last year. But with Torts, Torts likes to play defense. He likes to play hard, in-your-face hockey. They're not going to cheat the game the way that they've been doing in the last couple of years. And, you know, his name has value, but he could be discounted in drafts because of his stats over the last couple of years. Um, and I've kind of avoided this for a little bit. The Leafs goaltending situation is a complete clusterfuck. Um, if I were going this route, I would take both and I'd handcuff them together. And if you do this, it may produce results because the Leafs last year, they had the second best offense and the ninth best defense last year. So they're sure to produce wins for whichever of these guys starts. But last year, Sam Sonoff had an 896 save percentage and a 3.0 goals against. And he was on the sixth best defensive team last year. The Capitals were sixth best in shots against. So I wouldn't bank on him necessarily. But Murray showed flashes of good play and finished with a 906 and a 3.1 goals against average on a much worse Ottawa Senators team. So of the two, I would expect Murray to get slightly more starts. But one slip up and all bets are off. And so, you know, it's a very difficult decision to, to figure out what to do with Leafs goaltending. They're a good team. You may want to add, um, you know, one or both of these guys. If I were you, if if you want to go there, I would get both. Uh, and they will probably be available later in drafts because people kind of understand that concept as well. So overall, the summary, we went over a lot today. Um but the summary here is, if you watch the first video, it almost doesn't matter who you get. It matters where you draft them. So when you're in your draft, once it gets towards the 30 range, you want to take a look at that G1 list. And anybody who's still available on that G1 list, you can go into the dashboard that I've created, pick out which guy you feel is the best out of who's left, and pick that guy. If you can, try to pick two goalies off that G1 list because you're going to get more starts and you're not going to have to worry as much. You want reliable goaltending that you can count on. You don't want to take risks, especially early on in the draft. If you take risks and you swing and miss, it could destroy your team. So if you can't do that, if you start picking your goalie in the sixth round or something, go for a top-tier tandem. Try to get Swayman and Ulmark together. Try to get Quick and Peterson together. Try to, you know, if you want to, get Murray and Samsonov together. Any of those tandems that we talked about, um, you can look at the defensive metrics. Again, on the you know my dashboards, I have a team defense one, and you can look at all the top team defenses and pick a, you know a tandem from one of those teams. Um, and remember, you don't want to reach for a goalie in the first two rounds. You don't want to reach for a goalie uh, as your G one in terms of if you're trying to pick a G one, he's got to be reliable. He's got to be safe. It's better. If he's been playing behind that defense for a while because he's more comfortable and familiar with where the shots are going to come from, um, typically you want to pick a guy who's got a good penalty kill in front of him because that can destroy his save percentage and goals against if he's really good five on five, but he's getting shelled on the power play. Um, and then another thing, you know, that that bonus, um, you know, the bubble team bonus, if you want to go that route, you could potentially pick up a guy who's on a, a you know a bubble playoff team and they're going to have to start him down the stretch as opposed to a guy who's a bona fide number one on a great team who you're going to have to reach to get in the first or second round and then they're not going to play him during your fantasy playoffs. Um, so this was a, a much longer video, much longer than I wanted to go, but there was a lot to cover. We're going over most of the goalies in the league and kind of ranking them based on what your needs are and what this fantasy draft strategy is. So hopefully this provided some value for you. Um, and keep an eye out. I'll be doing some more videos. It's now crunch time. Fantasy drafts are going to start happening uh, over the next month plus. 
So, um, you know, I want to thank you again for tuning in. And uh, if you like this video, share it with your friends. I don't care if you like and subscribe. I mean, that obviously helps, but share it with people that you think might help uh, or get some, some assistance with this draft series. Uh, maybe don't share it with the guys in your league. Um, but, you know, if you want, you, you have some, some resources here to potentially help you. And uh, the more you spread it around, the more it helps this channel and the more work I can do for you to help you win. So thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one.